Amen. That's all right. Amen. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, you get me some. Praise the Lord, everybody. Hey, good to be in church tonight. Are you happy to be in church? I'm glad to be in church. Amen. The Bible says you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Amen. I'm going to play something for you. Will y'all let me do that? Y'all might, might have to bear I hope y'all packed the lunch tonight. I hope you ate supper before you came. I forgot what I'm doing. Oh, never mind. I remember. All right, guys, this is the real deal, okay? I want y'all to... Well, let me get this other microphone. Amen. This is Nathan Harrods, your missionary to Spain. I'm calling to give you an update of the exciting things that have been happening this past month. I was able to join the A-team in Malawi, Africa for a Holy Ghost crusade. And in the crusade in the city of Salima, we saw the Lord do many mighty miracles. In one service, as I spoke the word of faith, 18 deaf ears instantly opened up. People fell to their knees weeping, holding their ears and worshiping God. There were blind eyes open, tumors that disappeared. And the greatest miracle was that around 900 received the Holy Ghost during these crusades in Africa. Also, during deputation this month in Minnesota, there was a lady with a cancerous tumor of the size of an orange on her underarm. As we prayed, that tumor completely disappeared. A lady in Rochester, Minnesota, came up for prayer for a leg that was about three inches shorter than the other. As we prayed, everyone there watched as that leg grew out to the length of the other. There is nothing that our God can't do. Also, our five-year-old Elena received the Holy Ghost and was baptized while in Vatican City. Amen. Yeah, I'm about to tell who it is. When you give your money on Missionary Sunday, that's what it's going toward. 900 people filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. 18 deaf ears open. Tumors the size of an orange disappearing instantly. A leg growing out. I'm talking about something that's real. Amen. Amen. That's Brother Nathan Herod. He's a missionary that this church supports. He came through here a while back. I tried to get him to come back uh, to tell you the truth. Amen. I'm so happy to have our guests with us. Good to see you all with us. Good to see you with us. Amen. I'm so happy to have everybody here. My goodness gracious. I, I'm speechless. I don't know what the Lord, I, I don't know what he's doing. I, and I don't mean this ugly. I, I don't really care. I'm just, I told you all a long time ago, strap in and hang on. Because he's going to do things to blow your mind. Amen. That's the God I serve. He's not just the everyday run of the mill. Just, oh, well, maybe he moves, maybe he doesn't. When he touches you, you know you've been touched by the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm glad I can say it's real. We're going to end our series tonight. And I, I uh, for those of you that haven't been here previously, I apologize. But um, we happen to have the CDs. You can buy them if you'd like to. But it's things we can do every day. Everybody say every day. Amen. Things we can do every day that will guarantee that will guarantee you to be successful in living for God. Is anybody interested in that? Amen. They will guarantee you to be successful. The one that we find tonight, and I'll tell you what, because of our guests that are here and because of some of you that I'm scared of, that y'all might jump on me after church. I'm scared to pre preach this or whatever it is. I'm scared, so y'all, I saved the worst for last. I'm just teasing, kind of. Every day, the word that you need to learn for tonight is to yield. To yield. That comes from the Greek word peristemi or peristano, and it means simply to present. To be yielded to God, you actually present yourself to Him. Can I tell you your whole self? You present yourself to Him 
as a subject would to his ruler. When we come into the presence of the Lord, we would bow down before him and offer our complete self to him. That's why sometimes uh, that our legs get to jumping and our hands get to flopping and our mouth begins to open up and scream praises unto God is because we presented ourselves to him. Amen. I want to present myself to him. Romans chapter number 6, verse number 12 says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. That lets us know right there that we can have control over sin. That there's something that can happen in your life that allows you to have control over sin. The Bible says, let not. The way, way we would say that is don't let sin be the boss of you. Don't let sin reign in your body. That you should obey it in the lust thereof. Verse 13, neither yield. Everybody say yield. yield. And yield means to present. Neither present ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield to present yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Now, your members is your entire body. It's each individual part that makes up your body, not the least of which is your mind. Can I tell you, if you just turn your mind over to the Lord, it'll completely change your life. Just completely turn your body over to the Lord, it'll change your life. Yield yourself, yield your members, yield your hands, your feet, your mouth, the very things that you give to the world. Now listen to me right now. That first drink, that first drink of whiskey or beer, that first hit on a joint, that first time in the back seat, it didn't just jump on you all of a sudden. But you went there. When you gossip, it don't just come out of your mouth. But you went there. You took yourself there. I said it before, I'll say it again. Flip Wilson made a whole lot of money on selling something that we believe today. The devil didn't make you do it. The devil don't have that much power. The devil doesn't have that much power. If we sin, it's because we took our bodies there. And then in many cases, sin took control of us. And we no longer were our own boss, but we served sin. We present our bodies to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. And the scripture warns us against this and offers an alternative. I'm glad to tell you, and I said this a few, sometime back along down the road, that I'm glad that the Bible is not just full of thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, brother Billy, but it offers an alternative. It offers another way. There is a better way. There is a brighter path. There is a better opportunity. And you'll find it all in the same place. At the feet of Jesus. At the feet of Jesus. My body, my entire body now belongs to him. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, What? Everybody say, What? what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God. It came from God, and ye are not your own. Now, i got to give you a little background here. Anytime, you church folks better know this. In the Bible, in the New Testament, what do we learn in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? The life of Jesus Christ. What do we learn in the book of Acts? How to get saved. What do we learn in Romans through Jude? How to stay saved. Those are written to church folks. You got to remember that this scripture is written to church folks. It's reminding them of what has taken place in their lives and what they need to do in order to stay that way. Amen? Then, of course, Revelation tells us why we want to be saved. 
Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore, oh God, therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which belong to Him. That's what happens when you're filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost according to the Bible plan. That's what happens when you're born again. It's no longer you belong to you, but you've given yourself to Him. And glorify God in your body and in your spirit. If you've got the Holy Ghost and they start singing about it's real and you just sit there, you need to check your Holy Ghost. If you can just sit there when the Holy Ghost is moving, something's wrong. The old guy said one time, if that don't stir your soul, your spoon fell out of your bowl. We got to realize uh, the Bible says glorify God in your body and in your spirit. I agree there's a time that we might just sit there and meditate on God. But when the spirit starts moving, we're going to glorify him. We're going to glorify him. Remember, my body belongs to him. For sin shall, verse 14, back in Romans 6, Brother Shannon, for sin shall not have dominion. Raj, I thought he wasn't coming to church tonight. I thought he got so tore up at us the other day. <laughs> he wasn't even here at church time. <laughs> I thought, oh, goodness, I done made him mad. You know what I'm talking about, don't you, huh? <laughs> for sin shall not have dominion over you. Sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Now here's the deal. Let me share with you. Remember, I'm talking about yield. Present yourself to God. Grace destroys the power of sin. Where sin once held the power, and if you sin, you died, it has now been rendered powerless by the grace of God. Now, grace, am I too loud? All right, good. Grace is ultimately what saves us. Amen? Amen. Grace is what saves us. Jesus came to earth, in order that he might die, and in doing so, accepted the punishment for our sin. So no longer do we have to die for our sins. Remember, the Lord told Adam and Eve in the garden, if uh, when they sinned, you shall surely die. Sin brought death, which is separation from the eternal life that God has for us. Okay, Jesus came and accepted the punishment for our sin. This causes sin to have no more power. Jesus shed his blood as a perfect sacrifice one time for all of humanity. So now, hear me now, so now whosoever will. That's the only obstacle we run into when it comes to salvation. That's the only obstacle we run into in living successfully for God. It's a matter of will. Will I or will I not? I taught about it Monday night in Bible study. Joshua very emphatically told the children of Israel in his farewell address, choose you this day whom you'll serve. Choose you. Jesus shed his blood once and for all for all humanity. So now, whosoever will can come and be delivered from serving sin by becoming a servant to the mighty God who is greater than anything, and his name is Jesus. When we invoke the name of Jesus in the face of sin, then sin is reminded of the victory that Jesus won, 
which culminated with the defeat of sin's powerful judgment, which is death. Yes, I grant it. Jesus died and was buried in the tomb. The stone was rolled over the door. But when the stone rolled away of its own accord and Jesus came out of the grave, sin had no more power over any human being. Okay, sin had no more power. He defeated the judgment of sin. Okay, but check this out. Verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? So, does that mean since the Lord did all this, since he died for our sins, that we can just do whatever we want? And just say, I'm saved by grace. Would you agree that there are many people in the religious world that that's how they live? That I'm just saved by grace. The Lord knows I'm a sinner. So pop a top again. Okay? Grace, let me help you right now. Grace is not a license to sin. Grace is the opportunity to do better. Grace is the open door. Grace made a way. Before grace, we had no hope. Before grace, we had no opportunity. Before grace, we were doomed, Brother David. But ye that were sometimes afar off are now made nigh or brought close or brought in by the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace gives us the opportunity to do better. And grace gives us the opportunity to continue to do better. Verse 16. Know ye not, don't you know, that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. Don't you know that what you do with your hands, with your mouth, with your eyes, with your ears, with your feet, with your toes, with your, with your knuckles... Every part of you, your mind, where you put it, and what you put in it is what you serve. Whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Now hear me right now. There are only two options. Okay? Okay? Come on, stay with me now. There are only two options. One of them is to serve the Lord, and the other one is to serve sin. It's impossible. Everybody say impossible. Impossible to stay neutral on this battlefield of life. We will either serve sin and suffer the penalty of death, or we will serve God by being obedient to his word, which is righteousness. And can I tell you, we have to make them promise to come back because I'm going to tear it up the next time. Can I tell you that if you do nothing, you're actually working for the devil? Does anybody not believe that? I hope, I hope there ain't nobody going to raise their hand. Say, well, I'm not really going to work for the Lord, but I'm not, I'm not out here doing all that sinning and stuff either. Right? I'm just kind of going to stick it in neutral for a while and coast. If you're doing that, as a Holy Ghost-filled child of God, you're working for the devil. Come on now. If you've been filled with the Holy Ghost, Jesus said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the world. And if we do nothing, we sure enough ain't working for the Lord and he's not being allowed to do what he wants to through us. So then... What's that mean? 
The devil wins if we don't do something for the Lord. How many of you remember the story I've told you before of the millionaire? That when he died, Brother Billy, in his last will and testament, he said, I'm going to leave my mansion to the devil. And he left strict instructions that when he died, they were to build a huge tall fence around his property and leave it alone. Brother David, over the years, the windows fell out. The steps caved in. The roof blew away. Weeds grew up through the porch. There was nothing left of the, of the splendor of this once great mansion. Everybody thought he was nuts when he said, I'm leaving it to the devil. But when it's left neglected, the devil takes over. So, saint of God, you hear me right now. We don't have the option to do nothing. Say, well, I'm not able to do much. If you have the ability to tell me you're not able to do much, you have the ability to call somebody's name out in prayer. Call my name out in prayer. Go up and down the aisles praying for folks. Get out your phone book as our dear sister Bernice used to do and go down the phone book calling people, inviting them to church. Saints of God, can I tell you, it's time that we begin to yield ourselves to the Lord every day. We do a good job in church, uh, most of us do, but it's time we begin to yield ourselves to the Lord every day. And if we begin to yield ourselves to him on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, when we come into the house of God, it'll be like striking a match or, or pouring gasoline on a fire. You'll just begin to quiver till you explode under the power of the Holy Ghost because this is where it's at. This many Holy Ghost-filled people coming together, the potential is limitless. Limitless. Verse 17. But God be thanked. Everybody say, thank God. thank God. That you were the servants of sin. Oh, I like that word, Brother David. Thank God that you were the servants of sin. Because I know some of you have been thinking. You keep telling me that I don't have the, that sin has no dominion over me, but I keep messing up. I've read that for years, Brother Terry. And for years I kept messing up. Sin has no authority over me. Sin has no power over me. But yet every day I found myself battling it again. I felt like I was in a fight for my life. Lay my head down at night. Feel not even worthy of a blissful rest. Because I've been fighting with sin all day. Well, stay with me for just a minute now. But thank God that I was the servant of sin. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form, that mold. That pattern, that's what that word means, is that pattern of doctrine which was delivered you. Thank God that you were the servant of sin. So you're telling me that this is the way to get out of being the servant of sin? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Obey the word of God. Obey the word of God. Believe it. Obedience from the heart, Brother Robbie, means that it's down on the inside of you. That you don't have to understand it. Uh, you don't have to comprehend it. Uh, you just got to obey it. That form of doctrine which was delivered you. That pattern of the gospel which was delivered you. But instead of serving sin, according to this verse, instead of serving sin in the flesh which leads to death, we got to thank God. We got to thank God that we're not that way. He made a way for us. This way is called the gospel or the good news of Jesus Christ. 
The gospel of Jesus Christ is that Christ died, was buried, and rose again. Christ died, was buried, and rose again. But watch this. Verse number 18. He said, thank God you were the servant of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered to you. So when you obeyed what the Bible says, get this, being then, when is then? After you obey what the Bible says. Ye became the servants of righteousness. Then, after obedience to the gospel, you became free from sin and began to serve righteousness. Verse 19 says, I speak after the manner of men because the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your member servants to uncleanliness and to iniquity unto iniquity, which means lawlessness, doing whatever felt good to you, even so now yield your member servants to righteousness unto holiness. Paul is declaring plainly that you once served sin, but you're now a servant to righteousness. If what you have on the inside is real, it will show up on the outside. Now hear me right now. We will always give time for new babies in Christ to grow up. Perfect example. We got Papa Bear, Mama Bear, and Baby Bear. Huh? They're all three good. They're all three beautiful. They're all three precious. They're all three perfect. But they're all growing at three different rates. So do people when they get living for God. People grow differently. People respond differently. Some people got, th got more hell they got to get rid of than others. But the bottom line is, is get them on the right track, headed in the right direction. The devil will try to tell you after your first mistake, hey, you ain't got nothing. You ain't got nothing. We're always going to err on the side of patience. If you see somebody get on a platform that don't look like you think they ought to look like, know this, I ain't went blind. Okay, I ain't lost my mind. But we're trying to build a church that'll be raptured. And we're going to fight every devil in hell to keep every soul that comes into those doors. We're not going to back down. We're not going to give up. We're not going to be intimidated. We're not going to be scared. Because the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So you got to understand this. Please understand this. God isn't looking to destroy you for making a mistake. He understands how the human body and mind works. He's not looking to, if the, the Lord ain't like the, you remember the bad kid in school who was really the goody, goody, goody kid? And he loved to find somebody doing something wrong so he could say, teacher, 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 teacher. Look what he did. Y'all remember that? Remember that big dummy in school? That's the one you wait on at the bus stop. <laughs> Till you see how many buddies he's got with him. The Lord ain't like that. He came to earth, wrapped himself in flesh, gave his life and died, beat his back, crammed thorns on top of his head, spit in his face, called him a liar. So you might be saved. What kind of pack of lies is the devil trying to tell you that the Lord would go through all of that and you make a mistake and he'd say, I'm done with you. You've got to remember this. He gave his life for you. 
He, oh God, right now, help me. He's got a whole lot invested in helping you. He's got a lot of blood, sweat, and tears invested in helping you. He ain't looking to destroy nobody. He wants to save the world. Well, I feel the Holy Ghost up in this place right now. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that he is our high priest who was tempted in all points. Everybody say all points. Like as we are. But he didn't sin. He overcame the flesh. And because he did, we can. Because he did, we can. But we must strive. We must work. We must prepare to become what God wants us to be. We got to fight. We got to claw. We got to scratch. And I might fall. But by the grace of God, I'm getting up. And by the grace of God, I'm going to keep going the right way. And I might be bruised. And I might be bleeding. And I might be battered on the inside. But I'm just going to keep on going toward him. I'm, and, and, and can I tell you, can I tell you that there's a whole lot of folks up in here that are going to be there with you every step of the way. We're going to be there with you in spirit. And if you need us, we're going to be there with you in flesh. That's what I mean about yield. There's too many people trying to live for God these days uh, like they bring the Holy Ghost in their lunchbox. Bring it into the house of God, tear it up, go home and put it on a shelf. Till next time. I come to tell you, and I'm not damning and condemning anybody, I come in to tell you, if you figure out that ain't the way it's supposed to work, and you realize how it is supposed to work, your life will never be the same. It will never be the same. We're not trying to change God into our image. We're not trying to get God to change his plan, not his way. We're trying to find his way. We're planning to walk in his way, having our steps ordered or determined by him. We have been redeemed from sin, bought with a price, not with silver and gold, not with tradition handed down from your grandma to your mama to you, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That's what he paid. Brother Billy, that's the price he paid that we might be free from sin. We have been redeemed from sin as God defines it, not as the world defines it. Sin is anything that causes separation between you and God, and that does not change like the weather. His word is forever settled in heaven. When you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost the biblical way, <coughs> It will change you in ways you never even imagined. Your desires will change. Your priorities will change. Your thinking will change. Uh, the way you dress will change. Uh, your entire lifestyle will change. We change not to follow a set of rules, uh, but we change because we've been born again, leaving the habits and ideas of the flesh and learning to live again according to the Spirit of God. Can I tell you that it is the ultimate do-over? You get another chance. You get another start. I don't care where your life has been going now. I wish somebody would agree with me. I don't care where your life has been headed now. When you turn it over to Jesus, it's a new day. It's a new start. It's a new beginning. It's a new life. It's a new day. When we repent, can everybody say repent? Amen. That's the first step to salvation. Repentance means turn your back on your old life. When you repent does not mean you're saved. It does not mean you've arrived. It just means you've had a mind change, which has led to a life change of purpose. No longer am I trying to go the way of the world. 
but I'm trying to go the way of the Lord. No longer am I seeking death, but I'm seeking life. Repentance. Repentance is dying out. It's crying out to God with a prayer of sacrifice, giving myself up completely to Him. Being sorry, saying you're sorry and being sorry for every sin you've ever committed. And after we repent, we can be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, the only saving name, baptized in Jesus' name, and then we are assured, can I tell you we're assured of being filled with the gift, everybody say gift, of the Holy Ghost. And when you go through these steps, this form, this pattern for salvation, which is Acts 2.38, which is Acts 8.16, which is Acts 19.5, and, and so on and so forth. Acts chapter number 10. They all got the Holy Ghost the same way. They repented. They were baptized in Jesus' name, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost, uh, evidenced by speaking in other tongues. When you do that, you will always face opposition. The devil doesn't want you to achieve what he knows God has for you. And the devil doesn't want you to get to go where he got kicked out of. There are some ways that we can arm ourselves. There are some habits that we can form that will ensure that he cannot defeat us. Are you interested in it? Let's review just a minute. Every day. Everybody say it. Every day. The first thing that we learned in this lesson was ministry. This is work in the church. Enlisting in ministry. This is where you use your gifts and abilities inside the church in order to grow the church. The second thing we learned was about prayer. Talking to God on a daily basis. Following a pattern of prayer whereby you die out to yourself, allowing the Spirit of God to work on you and then work through you. The way you pray is the same way you talk to anybody. I don't know where we ever got in the business of most holy, magnificent, benevolent Savior. He's your friend. He loves you. You talk to him like he's your friend. He's your Savior and he wants to help you. And you tell him, I need help. It's just that simple. You talk to him like he's your friend. He loved you before you were even born. He knew everything there is to know about you. He's seen every step you've ever taken. The third thing that we learn to do every day is evangelism, which is extending the reach of the church through evangelism. This is where you use your gifts and abilities outside the church in order to grow the church. The fourth thing we learn is read your Bible every day. Read the Logos word, which is the entire word as a whole from Genesis to Revelation. Just read it. Absorb it. Think about it. Just pick out a spot and read it. But as you grow, Brother Billy, as you grow and as you grow closer to the Lord and as you, as you eat and devour more of the word, there will also be a rhema word for you. The Word of God will speak to you directly from His Word, His inspired Word, right into your life for a particular or specific situation. But this usually only comes after the Word has been put in your heart through daily repetition. And the fifth thing is to yield. There are three things. I'm not going to be able to get done with all of this, but I want to tell you what they are. There are three things we have to learn to yield. This is the last step we'll cover for now. 
We must learn to yield or present ourselves to God instead of to the flesh or the things of the world. Now we, all us sanctified folks, have decided that that yielding only has to do with coming out of the world and being saved. But once you're filled with the Holy Ghost, uh, there's more of a need for you to yield yourself. Because you have more power, more authority, more ability than you ever had before. The first thing that we have to learn to yield is our time. In the day that we live, one could argue that there's no more precious thing than our time. That's my time for me to do what I want, when I want, how I want. If I want to eat, I'm grown, I work for a living, I'll eat. If I want to roll around in the floor, if I want to sit in every recliner in my living room 30 minutes at a time, Brother Billy, I can do what I want because that's my time. But when I yield, Brother Pete, and I realize I don't belong to me, then my time has become his time. Whatever we spend our time on is what's valuable to us. And I, in our culture now, and I hope, no hoping about it, I know that this is decreasing around here because we got too much going on at the church. But the average person spends nearly 40 hours a week either on the internet or watching television. 40 hours a week on the internet or watching TV. That's the average person. If you allow eight hours of sleep per night, which is an average, there are about 110 hours a week left. Following the principle of the tithe, and this is just as a guide. This is not Bible. I'm not telling you it's got to be this way. As a matter of fact, I'm telling you this probably ought to be the least we do. If you follow the principle of the tithe, which is 10%, we could say then it would be fair to give God 11 hours a week. Does that make sense? We have about 110 hours that we're not asleep. So it'd be fair to give God 11 hours a week. So if you're faithful to church, under normal circumstances, when somebody else is preaching besides me, I'm trying to do better. I've only been preaching between 20 and 30 minutes on Sunday nights. Y'all ain't even notice. Y'all about to kill me, that's why. No, I'm, just, I'm just teasing. If you're faithful to the house of God, you will give approximately six hours a week to church. If you attend prayer meeting, you'll give another hour. Now we're at seven. If you attend Monday night Bible study, you get another hour. Now we're at eight. So that leaves three hours a week beyond what the church offers. Following this principle to give to Bible reading, prayer, or volunteering in ministry. Is it too much to ask if the average person gives 40 hours to the internet and TV? Is it too much to ask to give one-fourth of that to the Lord. Because that's what basically it boils down to. Is it too much to ask to give God one-fourth of the time that you give Facebook and Young and the Restless? Why do you think so much is happening? Boy, I must have hit a nerve right then. Boy, you preach about anything you want, but don't be preaching about my stories. Huh? I just felt somebody likes the young and the restless. Or some of other sort. I told you, I, I got all over this gal the other day. Her and her husband fussing and stuff. And then she told me, she said, all I do when I'm at home is watch... Uh, 
that pitiful. No, no, it ain't no stories. Oh, goodness. What? Yeah, that's it. Keeping up with the Kardashians. And uh, I want to say the best housewives, but that ain't, that ain't what it is. What? Real housewives. I said, you got to quit watching that junk. That junk's stupid. It ain't real. All them people got more money than they know what to do with. That junk ain't real. Stop watching that stuff. I hope ain't nobody here watching that stuff. Why do you think so much good is happening around our church? It's because people are giving more of their time to God, and that leaves less time for things of the flesh. That also shows... That also shows the Lord, I'm serious about this church business. I'm serious about this heaven business. I'm serious about winning souls and seeing our church grow and pulling people back from the pit of hell. The second thing we got to learn to give to the Lord is our talent, our abilities. God-given abilities. And of course, I can say the obvious things. Play instruments, sing, teach. You think of a, of a zillion other ones that, that you think everybody else has got that you don't. That's how we look at talent, right? But what about your abilities that make you a good employee? The things that make you a worker that's in demand. Things that help you climb the ladder of success. Maybe you make friends easily. Maybe you're a good conversationalist, which I am, but I'm, I'm, I'm praying through about it because my family makes fun of me. Because wherever we go in the world, Brother Billy, I make a friend and sit down and start talking to him, and the kids go, Dad, stop doing that. You're embarrassing us. I don't know why it embarrasses them. It embarrasses the mama too. Maybe you, 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 you know how to strike up a conversation with people. Maybe you've got really good organizational skills. Or maybe you're somebody that just knows how to follow directions really good. I don't know that there's that many of them folks running around these days. Use those abilities for the kingdom of God instead of for your own kingdom. Use your talents and your abilities that God gave you that caused you to be good when you punch the clock, that have caused you to be able to have money in the bank and CDs and, and go on trips and stuff. Use those abilities for the kingdom of God. This is what's eternal. Oh, goodness, I did not have to go there, did I? Brother, Brother Pete, have it in my notes here. I'm, I'm going to have to quit. I'm four minutes over. Feels like 40. Matthew 6, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all the things that we spend all our time on already. The Lord has said, I'll give them to you if you just put me first. Well, I feel like preaching about another hour. Did nobody amen that? Come on, brother. Talking about your abilities. Brother Terry, Brother Johnny, Brother David, myself, we'll soon be registering for that again. Hope to take a few people with us again. We go to Alexandria to because of the times every year. It's a conference where between 2,500 and 3,000 pastors, preachers, teachers, men that help in the church go every January for three days. We're just right near close to heaven. Unbelievable preaching, teaching, a little bit of singing, but not a whole lot, just putting the word in you. They close it off to their local church folks. They're not allowed to come. But a great many, I heard somebody say they didn't like that. A great many of their church, these fellas can tell you, the parking lot is full of folks parking cars. The lobby is full of people working booths. 
They're all volunteers. They all volunteer. A great many of them take their vacation time to be off that week. Come on now, y'all got to hear this. They take their vacation from work to work at the church for that week and they don't even get to go to the services. And that's the smilingest, happiest, glad handedness to happy everyone, friendly, grinning, happy to serve you. And they just run 2,500 in church. There's a reason for that. We got to get kingdom minded. We got to get kingdom minded. When you see me over here in the middle of the day, don't drive by, come in. I'm waiting. I got all my junk on that I pray with, all my stuff, and I got my hand on it because as soon as you walk through the door, I'm going to lay it all down. Because <laughs> I look goofy. But I know many of you see me here at various times. Come with me. Come be with me. If you don't have a key, knock on the door. The kids in the neighborhood do. People that get kingdom minded. People that get God minded. People that decide they want revival at any cost will prove it. And then the third thing. I'm going to say it real quick. I'm glad you're going home on this one. Time, everybody say time. time. Talent. Talent. Treasure. Treasure. The great big taboo. The thing we ain't supposed to talk about at church. But the Bible says more about than it does salvation. That's your money. Matthew 6, 21 says... I'm just going to tell you all before I get started, I got some new friends over here. And if we had to fight our way out of here tonight, I'm not by myself. My brother ain't here tonight. But I got some other brothers over, ain't that right? I done come between him and his buddy over there. <laughs> For where your treasure is, there will be your heart, or there will your heart be also. So where your finances are is where your heart is. Therefore, if you invest in the kingdom, then that's where your heart will be. Now, he doesn't even ask for much. Truth of the matter is, he doesn't ask for much. Tithe and offerings. And true servants of Christ have no problem being obedient to Scripture by giving 10% back to God. Because it's all his anyway. All he requires is 10%. The offerings are up to the giver. True servants of Christ have long since proven that they can go further on what they have after tithing and after offerings than they used to go on 100%. But it's not about the money. He don't need your money. It's about yielding. It's about yielding. And the one surefire way to make sure that money never matters to you, give it away. If you can give it away, you don't love it. No man, 6 and 24, no man, about two more minutes. Did I say that two minutes while ago? Okay, two minutes. No man can serve two masters. For he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And that word actually means money. I purposely have not spoken too much about tithing and giving other than to tell you how blessed you can be. There's a twofold reason why that I haven't. Number one is the vast majority of this church gives faithfully and many of you give above and beyond faithfully. 
And the second reason is, is the stigma that is so often spoken, which is money, money, money. That's all he wants is money, money, money. That's all they're after. And I come to tell you a thousand times, no, you're wrong. It's not about money. If more folks start tithing and giving, it's only going to go for blessing people more. More work on our building. More reaching out to the poor. Activities for our youth. It's for the kingdom. We must learn that we have been called to serve him. And by serving others, we serve him. Time, talent, and treasure are three ways we can do that. In doing these things and doing them every day, we will find ourselves becoming more and more successful. The proof is in the pudding. Look what the Lord is doing. Look around you. Look what the Lord is doing. As we have begun to teach and preach these principles, and as more and more people, Brother David, have been enacting these principles, look what the Lord has done. Daniel 11.32, let's stand. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall, be cor shall he corrupt by flatteries. That way being wicked against the covenant means failing to keep up your end of the bargain. He gave his life for you. All he asked you to do is serve him. But... The people that do know their God. Let me apologize for keeping you so long. I apologize for it. Very sorry. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits how do we know him we know him through his word through the power of the holy ghost through putting him to the test and him never failing not even once give me 12 romans 12 and i'm done verse 1 and verse 2 i beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of god that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable to God which is your reasonable service and be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God he's saying put him to the test I challenge you today to put him to the test as quickly as I can or have. I've tried to share with you the gospel of Jesus Christ while sharing with the precious people of this church another principle that we're going to have to follow in order to be successful in living for God. Again, I, 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 I'm so, I very much am sorry that I've kept you so long tonight. I can tell the look on some of your faces that you've already clocked out. <laughs> How are you doing, sweetie? Been, been praying for you this week. Thanks. You're going to do better. Thanks. Your name's Virginia. I've been calling Virginia's name out in prayer. I called Jackie's name out in prayer. Call Roger's name, Shannon's name. Now I'm going to be calling Cain's name. And in a few minutes, I'll be learning your name and call it. <laughs> but I call your names out too. Because we're all trying to get to the same place. Right. I'll be calling Gerald's name out now. <laughs> and when I start calling your name out, I believe what I'm preaching, saints. 
I believe what I'm preaching with all of my heart. The reason I believe is because God's doing it. He's doing it. Let's lift our hands up and thank the Lord for what he's doing right now. Dear Lord God in heaven, we thank you.